Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is John Tian. I'm on the City Retail Services team in the Consumer Bank, and I'm based in Atlanta. I appreciate the round of applause, but really the round of applause. Uh, let's do another one for Tara Carlage and for Sonny Lee, our two great colleagues who were just up on the phone. I love that at City, we are all about diversity for all the right reasons, but we, were, we really worked hard to make sure that we had Army, Terra, and Marines, Sunny. So couldn't get everybody in there, Air Force, Navy, and Coast Guard, but uh, I think we did pretty well. So again, uh, Terra and Sunny, who work in this building, it's so great to see them up on the screen. Pretty sure they're in the room here somewhere as well. Um, I'd love, I, I love welcoming you to today's event, and I'm doing it on behalf of my fellow City Salutes National Co-Lead at Schuyler, who you're gonna see moderate the fireside chat, and also on behalf of the Institutional Clients Group. I do think that the fact that I could say those two things in tandem, City Salutes and ICG, really speaks and is so representative of what makes City great, a real one city event, a partnership between the business and between city diversity, in particular, the City Salutes affinity. So I know there's the good majority of the folks here are from ICG. What's even cooler is that on, in 16 video conference rooms throughout the United States of America, as well as London, we have our City Salutes chapters that are out there listening. And in those rooms, we have representatives from our 2,000 military veterans who have self-identified who are colleagues of all of yours, as well as many City Salutes uh, chapter members who have uh, family members in the military or are just supportive of what we're doing out there in the communities. What City Salutes is all about is helping to recruit, hire, and retain military veterans uh, in our great firm and also supporting military members, active duty, reserve, National Guard, as well as the military family members in the places that we all live and work, to include here in New York City, where you have a great City Salutes New York City chapter. Uh, of those 2,000 uh, military uh, active duty members who have transitioned into the city, I'm one of them. I served for 24 years in the United States Army, uh, served three combat tours in Iraq, uh, and one of my most exciting days at City uh, was about two months ago when Ed Schuyler, our uh, Chief Global Public Affairs Officer, called me, totally, totally caught me off guard and said, uh, John, I want to talk to you about uh, the national co-lead for City Salutes Affinity. And I said to him, yeah, do you want me to give my opinion on who you're thinking about selecting? And he said, hopefully it's going to be a positive one because it's you. Uh, so I appreciate that, Ed. It's a real honor to have been in this role for all of a month. And really, this is the first uh, public event that I'm, I'm getting to do as the co-ed. So it's very exciting. I'm going to turn to our uh, fireside chat now, uh, and it's my opportunity to introduce uh, a friend of mine. I'm going to talk a little bit more about him, and then I'll close again by reminding uh, all of you what a special privilege it is that Dave McCormick and I can call each other friends. On July 1st, 1983, uh, Dave McCormick, who is sitting uh, to Ed's right here, he and I both raised our right hand on the plane of the United States Military Academy up at West Point. It's only about an hour north of here in New York City. And we raised our right hand and we swore an oath to uh, support and defend the Constitution of the United States. We were members together of the class of 1987 of the United States Military Academy. Uh, Dave and I were in fact cadet captains together at the United States Military Academy. Uh, and then when we graduated, I headed off to graduate school. Uh, Dave did a little bit of graduate school uh, time himself. And then he moved on to the 82nd Airborne Division, which is a famous, famous uh, division in the United States Army and World War II, and uh, in particular, all the wars since then. And from there, he deployed uh, to Operation Desert Storm, Desert Shield and Desert Storm uh, in Iraq and served a combat tour of duty. Coming out of there, he left the Army and moved on for, to really be a leader, not just in his local community, but as you'll soon find out, or if you read his bio, across the nation and even for the world. Uh, he joined McKinsey as a consultant, moved to Pittsburgh, uh, helped start and lead uh, freemarkets.com in the private sector, and then answered the call of service, and in, in all while doing, wrote a book, uh, right, got a PhD at Princeton, uh, but then answered the call of service again when the administration, and in particular President George W. Bush, called on him and said, Dave, it's, we need you to serve again. Dave dropped everything he was do doing, went to the uh, U.S. Department of Commerce, served as a senior leader there. Then President Bush asked him to come to the National Security Council. He served as the, really the, the lead senior economics advisor for global 
uh, economic affairs for President Bush, and then culminated his uh, US government career as the Under Secretary of Treasury uh, for International Affairs. And that was the, not the next time, but that was the time where Dave and I served a, literally on the same team together when I joined the Bush administration in 2008 to help Iraq policy. Dave was overseeing, helping advise, not just the president, but uh, really national and global leaders on how to deal with the financial crisis. And for all of you here at Citi, I was, I was obviously at the White House at the time, you knew what 2008 looked like. We were lucky to have Dave in that key uh, position in uh, the Department of Treasury. When the administration ended, Dave went on and said, it's time to start uh, his private sector career again, joined Bridgewater, and over time has risen to the role of co-CEO of Bridgewater Associates, uh, which uh, again, tying it all back to the one city theme that I began with, is why ICG is a great sponsor of this event, because they are a great supporting person or in group to Dave as a client of theirs at ICG and Bridgewater Associates. So we're fortunate to have, please uh, uh, join me in a warm uh, welcome in city reception for David McCormick, uh, the co-CEO of Bridgewater Associates, uh, my fellow West Point classmate, and my very good friend, Dave McCormick. Thank you. And the first thing David's probably thinking is, why am I sitting next to an open fire in July? <laughs> and maybe we'll get to that during audience Q&A. Um, so thank you for, for uh, joining us. This is one of our first events in the, the new auditorium. And i um, pleased to see how full it is. And I know we have other people joining online as well. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about you know, your life story that uh, John ticked through. You know, nobody just winds up at West Point. So what was it in your upbringing or about your, your, uh, your childhood that motivated you to go to that institution? Well, um, first, thank you for having me. I'm so, I'm so happy to be here. I walked in. I, I think I've been in this building many, many years ago, but I walked in. It's absolutely beautiful. And it's great to be, be here in this auditorium for one of your first talks. And great to be here with John, um, who uh, is a great friend and really a great, great American. So thanks, um, thanks you, thank you all for having me. Uh, West Point was not, uh, not part of my game plan. So uh, I was in, in a small town, grew up in a small town in Pennsylvania, Bloomsburg, Pennsylvania, which is right, right outside of Scranton. And, uh, and I was hoping to play sports in college. And I wrestled and played football. And I wasn't really good enough to play football at Penn State, which is what every kid in, in uh, Northeastern Pennsylvania wants to do. And I got recruited to play football and wrestle and, uh, at West Point. And I really didn't want to, didn't really think I wanted to go to West Point, uh, but my dad insisted that I apply. He didn't, he said I didn't have to go, but I had to apply. And uh, and to my surprise, I got accepted because I wasn't, I wasn't the best student. And uh, and my little town um, sort of came alive when I got accepted. Um, it was the first person that had been accepted at one of the academies for 25 or 30 years. And it, it wasn't even a discussion among the people in the town whether I was going to go. It was, of course I was going to go. And, uh, and it just sort of grew on me. And the privilege that it was became more apparent. And so um, I went. And it really turned out to be uh, the, the best decision of my life because it opened, it opened up the world to me in a way that I can't imagine anything else would have done. So um, it was a little bit uh, fortuitous, but I'm, I'm so glad it happened. So it's hard to imagine a soldier being better prepared um, for being deployed uh, than attending West Point. But uh, thinking back in your experience in Desert Storm, is there anything that could truly prepare you for that experience? Well, you know, Desert Storm was interesting because, um, well, first of all, the Army is amazing for lots of reasons, but it's, for me, was most amazing because it's such a microcosm of the country. Um, it's not a microcosm socioeconomically. Um, unfortunately, it's mostly people from the lower quartiles, um, even in the officer corps for the, for just to some degree. But in terms of the diversity of, of the service, it's really one of the most integrated places in the country. And so um, coming from my little small hometown, which was very homogenous, you, you go into the Army, and you're dealing with people from Alabama and Newark and Miami. And um, there's always somebody from Brooklyn, right? There's always somebody from Brooklyn. In all the movies, there's always, always somebody Brooklyn. from Brooklyn. And, you know, very quickly, they, um, 
at that time it was an all-male unit, but they, they don't, they quickly forget what group they're from and they become part of a cohesive uh, unit and, um, and really they're most focused on the mission and, and your, your capacity to lead them in, in, in a role as an officer. And so, um, so at the 82nd, which John described, we, you know, we're constantly training for this possibility of being deployed. But, uh, but when it happened, it was, you know, still came out of the blue. And um, we were in a training exercise in Arkansas. And I remember getting a radio call to go to a certain grid. And we went there, and there were airplanes coming in. And we loaded back up on the airplanes and went back to Fort Bragg and, um, and, and uh, cleaned everything and loaded back up and flew to Germany and then landed, went from Germany to Saudi Arabia. And, you know, within, I don't know, three or four days or something, we were there. And, um, it's hard to remember what it was like at the time. I just, um, my mom found a bunch of old letters recently, which I went through. And, you know, having, having had the additional wars in Iraq, you lose a, a bit of a perspective because those were so much more significant. The challenges for leaders were so much bigger than anything that we encountered, who, those of us who went in, in, in the first Gulf War. It's not even comparable on scale. But at the time, it was significant in two ways we thought it was going to be a much bigger thing. And so you were preparing for something that you thought, if you remember at the time, they were saying there'd be 50,000 casualties, and there were Scud missiles, and um, the mother of all battles, nerve gas, and everything else. So that was the frame of mind for the many months leading up to it, um, to the point where people were writing letters of, to give to their pal that if they lost their life in combat, that they would, I mean, that was the frame of reference. Now, it's hard to imagine in retrospect, because there was so few casualties, but it, that was the frame of reference. And the, the unbelievable capability of the US military sort of was, was displayed in a way that I think surpassed anybody's imagination. So that was one thing that was significant about it. The other thing that was significant was it was really the moment at the end of the Cold War, War where America's role in the world was undeniably um, and universally uh, the sole superpower. And, um, and when you reflect back on that, um, it's such a different world now than it was then. And, um, and so for lots of reasons, it, it was a very seminal moment, I think, for the military, certainly for me personally. And lots of what's followed was a consequence of some of the time and reflections that I had there. So tell me how you go from Iraq to running a software company in Pittsburgh. Yeah, there's the... the, the, the uh, there's no straight line through any of these things, which is, um, you know, in one of your questions you sent, it was advice, you know, do you have any advice from veterans? Um, and the, the answer for me was um, that there's no clear line and you shouldn't aspire to a clear line because life is wonderful in part because it reveals, everything you do reveals something else that you could do. And, um, and having the flexibility to sort of navigate uh, those things as part of the part of what makes it so interesting and fun. And what happened with me was I was committed to the military. You know, I loved it. Um, I went to, came back from Iraq, went to the advanced course. I volunteered for an assignment in Korea, where I was going to be a company commander. And then West Point came in um, and asked me whether I'd be interested in teaching. And I said I would. So I applied to graduate school, and with the idea that I'd defer graduate school, go to Korea, and then come back and go to graduate school. And if I did that, that would have probably meant that I would have been on a track to stay in the Army. And so I wrote my essays for graduate school. And the essays are very much around what do you want to do with your life and so forth. And, and the essays really never ended with me thinking I wanted to be a career military guy, which surprised me in some ways. It was sort of a process that I... And so uh, surprising to me and everybody, including my dad, who thought I made the biggest mistake of my life, I resigned from the military at the end of that advanced course. And um, it absolutely, if you have any of you have parents like this who grew up where you, you, know, you want a pension and you know, you'd never you know, take big risk, it absolutely blew my father's mind because I resigned. I didn't have any plan. And I had this Jeep, old Jeep Cherokee. So I drove the Jeep Cherokee back to Pennsylvania and I uh, mailed the letters, and this was in November of, of uh, 1991. I had a bunch of leave that came and took me into the spring. 
And I said, I'm going to try to go to graduate school, but I won't, I won't know for five months, and then it won't be till September. So I have about a year to kick around. So my dad's like, head was sort of spinning around, like, what are you possibly thinking? And then I really blew his mind because I said, I think I'm going to go travel. And uh, it was a travel. What's travel? I mean, like, you know, get a job. That's what you need to do. And so I, uh, at the time, TWA had these tickets, which you buy a ticket and you could go in one direction. You could do as many flights as they as they uh, as you could do as long as you kept going the same direction. So for five thousand dollars, you could buy a ticket that you could have as many stops as you want as long as you kept going in the same direction around the world. So it was an around the world ticket. So I bought an around the world ticket, and I took off. And I had a big backpack full of books, and um, I'm going to find myself somewhere out there and decide what I'm going to do. And by the way, there's no email or cell phone, so the only way my parents keep up with me is I call them periodically. And so um, that's what I did. And I traveled for about a year, not nine months, something like that. I went to the Middle East and, you know, unfortunately, beautiful parts of Syria that are now gone, and Jordan and Egypt and Israel and... Then I went to Asia and Malaysia and Borneo and a bunch of different places. And by the time I came back, I was ready to go to school. And so that was the transition, which um, you know, at the time, it wasn't really purposeful, but it, and it ended up making a big difference for me. Speaking of transition, um, I want to read a quote that uh, you referenced recently, which was, on the return home, after the long absence from society and industry, many of these brave men find it difficult to get the opportunity to return to their vocations. The places at work are filled up, having little money, having lost to some extent the facility for securing employment or for the friends who might have helped them find it. They are greatly discouraged, disheartened, and their families suffer. Can you tell me a little bit about that, uh, that quote? Yeah, that was a quote that um, someone shared with me that I then subsequently used in an in article I wrote. And it was a quote from the Civil War. And, um, and the thing that struck me about that is if you could read that quote at any period through American history, post-Civil War, post-World War I, post-World War II, post-Korea, post-Vietnam, th that exact same description um, could have been used to describe essentially the failure of the country, of the armed services, you know, of community leaders to assist in the transition from, um, from uh, military life too productive to playing a productive role in society, and um, and I, I subsequently, you know, I, that was something that came up recently. But I had done a, a a research project which became a book on this when I was in grad school, which is um, the U.S. has been really remarkably great at building capability to go to war, but remarkably bad at transitioning to the next stage of peace and staying prepared for the next, you know, for the next war, whatever that would be. And so um, that quote really has stuck with me. And as I've gone through my business career, particularly in the last 10 years or so, and I've been in a position to try to play some small role in helping veterans transition, whether it's just taking a phone call or an email, somebody says, I'd like some advice, or whether it's a jobs program where we try to hire veterans, or whether it's helping in a variety of ways. Um, not, I think we're doing better this time as a country, but still probably lacking in many of the ways that we we need to step up in terms of helping our veterans. Uh, so one of the things we struggle with at City Salutes is not just the recruiting, but the retention of veterans. Um, do you have any thoughts on what companies could be doing better uh, to retain veterans and offer the support they need to be successful in the private sector? Yeah, I think it's, um, I mean, my experience with hiring veterans has been, there's been um, themes that have been pretty consistent uh, throughout throughout uh, that hiring process and the experience with the people that have joined. Um, and this was in free markets, and you know, this has been over the last 20 years. And the thing you almost always get, um, it's not 100%, but you almost always get unbelievable values, unbelievable dedication, a competence, um, you know, a focus on the broader mission, an ability to work in teams. Um, you know, it's been selected. They've been through a selection process, and they've come out the other end. That um, that that capability, that set of characteristics, if they didn't exist, they wouldn't have been successful. And so, to find that in any business is a remarkable thing. The thing that I've um, 
have found veterans to be challenged um, with, at least in my experience, and it's, it's only one person's experience, is that um, you know, the military has a certain hierarchy and a certain consistency and rigor around how choices are made. And lots of times, uh, business, it, there's the, the straight lines are not as clear. And so um, the, the willingness to sort of push the envelope, potentially break the rules, and also being able to speak up in a way where you, to, you tell your boss, that doesn't make sense, that's a stupid idea. Those things aren't, um, those things aren't necessarily always welcomed in the military. And so helping people make that transition, no, 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 it's, it's okay um, to challenge, constantly pushing and challenging. In fact, it's not just okay, we, we want it. We, we want you to say all the things you think don't make sense. We want you to push up in, in a 360 degree way. We want you to push the envelope in terms of the way we do it is maybe a stupid way to do it. We want you to tell us all the things that are stupid about it. Getting people in their comfort zone where they can do that authentically and naturally is part of the, is part of the, uh, the, the things that I've tried to help people in making that transition. And um, also, I think you've been a proponent of veterans serving the public sector as well. Yeah. Uh, and um, supporting an effort to encourage veterans of both parties to run for office. Yeah, I think um, uh, that right now there's, there's a number of things that aren't necessarily healthy and, and going right in the country. And if you think about the unbelievable degree of partisanship, um, the factionalism, um, the, the degree of, um, of uh, focus on self as opposed to focus on a, a broader purpose, there's always been you know, periods in history. I'm not, I'm not trying to make it sound like now is a particularly uniquely terrible time, but I think anybody that's lived through the last 20 years as an adult would feel um, the pressure and the strains on our country in a very personal way. And I've come to believe that a lot of what's um, wrong in the country could be addressed by some of those great things that I, I talked about with veterans in terms of the country over, over self in terms of the, the patriotism, the willingness, to, the courage um, to go into the public square and to, and to fight for what they believe is right. And so I've been a supporter, a financial supporter, and a public supporter of something called With Honor. And With Honor was an effort to try to get veterans from both parties to run for Congress. And it was grounded in the belief that Congress would be more bipartisan, more focused on country, if it had more veterans. And there's some data to support this. If you went back 30 years ago, about 80% of the members of Congress would have been veterans. The greatest generation coming out of World War II, many of them went and served in Congress, served as, as presidents, served in, in senior positions in government. Today, the veteran representation in Congress is 19%. And if you look at the, um, statistically, the degree of bipartisanship associated with those veteran lawmakers, it's much higher um, uh, than non-veterans. And there was a, a, a number of studies that were done to support that. And so my thought was, and I, I'm not unique in this, there's a number of other people that have advocated, more veterans in public life, um, I think, will lead to more bipartisan solutions to the problems of the day. And so With Honor raises money for veterans of both parties. And then um, if, if it supports them, they have to promise to be part of a bipartisan veterans caucus where they come together with other veterans, and they have to promise to bring forward bipartisan legislation in their first year uh, in, public, in public office. And, um, and that effort's underway, and I'm hoping we'll start to see a big difference. Let's shift a little bit uh, with the business world. You had a front row seat to the financial crisis about 10 years ago when you were an undersecretary at Treasury. Um, a lot was written uh, last year, sort of retrospective, about lessons learned. Um, sometimes in Washington we hear about people making the same mistakes that led us to the financial crisis. Are there any things going on in the financial system that you see now that show you that the, the right lessons weren't learned? Well, the, um, the, the, the old Mark Twain um, line about um, history doesn't repeat itself but it rhymes, um, I, think, um, I think comes to mind when you think of, of, of risks potential risk from a financial crisis. So there's lots of lessons. 
um, that many, many people learned from the financial crisis in 2008 and 2009. The regulators learned a lot. Um, the market participants learned a lot. Um, the public learned a lot. Uh, there was lots of learning. Some of that has manifested itself in some changes. Um, some of it, it not so much. Uh, but the next crisis is unlikely to be an exact replica of the, of the previous crisis. And my biggest takeaway from my experience was the importance of leadership uh, in that crisis. And um, I remember uh, a discussion with President Bush um, and Secretary Paulson and uh, Ben Bernanke and a couple other people at one point where he made, Bush made the point that he wasn't going to get that involved in some of the specifics around some of the programs that were being put in place because the biggest decision he had made in terms of how to deal with the financial crisis he had made long before the financial crisis, which was the selection of Hank Paulson and Ben Bernanke, and, um, and that those decisions would ultimately uh, be the decisions that were most important to how the country navigated its way through the financial crisis. And I think that, and I think that was true. And in the case of those two guys, and I'd throw um, uh, Secretary Geithner into the mix too when he was at the New York Fed, you had um, this really interesting combination of capabilities, extremely complementary, very different, um, where you had Paulson who was, you know, was always forcing and pushing for action and building the coalition, and you had Bernanke who, who was the cerebral, um, putting in a broader historical context, and you had Geithner who in that capacity at least was much more focused on the implementation and the sort of the mechanics of some of the policies. Just as an aside, uh, Bernanke um, was a professor when I was at Princeton. He was my economics professor. And um, he was this very mild-mannered, you know, sort of hardly ever raised his voice. And, uh, and, and then he became like the most powerful man in the world. And, and uh, I remember sitting next to him one time and saying, you know, when I was sitting at Princeton uh, and, I, and looking up at you in front of him, I said, the only thing more unlikely than Ben Bernanke being the chairman of the Federal Reserve and, you know, leading the, the world through a crisis was me being the undersecretary of treasury, and he said, <laughs> "You're right about that." Um, so, uh, so, but you had those three guys, super complimentary, and um, and then a ton of mistakes, and having the courage to try things. Oh, that's not working. Try something else, and be flexible and adaptable enough uh, to navigate through this, you know, horrendously difficult period. And if you were sort of standing there today and you'd have given anybody involved the opportunity to imagine the world we live in today, 10 years later, and say, would you take that world? What are the odds of getting to where we are today? Everybody across the board would have said, that seems inconceivable. But if we could have that world, we'd take it. Um, we'd take it. So the question, I think, um, to try to come back to specific what you're asking is, do we have the right people in place? Uh, that when the next crisis comes, whatever that is, that they'll be able to navigate it. And probably even more challenging, do we have the political climate that will allow reasonable people to make reasonable choices? Um, Ten years ago, we had that. Um, you know, there was lots of noise, but ultimately, the Republicans and Democrats came together across two administrations and made the choices necessary to sort of get us through it. I worry that um, you know we we wouldn't have that kind of political support today. And I think those are the things that we should most worry about. So there's certainly some new regulation that would address something we haven't thought about. But the most important thing, do we have the people and the political will to do what's necessary when the unexpected comes? You, talked a little, you touched a little bit about culture and about questioning authority in, um, in the military versus in the private sector. Talk a little bit about your experience at Bridgewater and how you would describe the culture there as far as questioning and how people feel empowered to, you know, to challenge no matter who, you know, who is in the room. Yeah, Bridgewater is, um, you know, it was, a, it was a surprise choice for me in terms of, uh, of, of going there. I left the Treasury and I took, I took um, a number of months to sort of collect myself. And, you know, I was, I was walking around the house with my sweatpants on and having shaven for three weeks. And my wife at the time finally said, okay, you've got to get on with your life and find employment. And, um, and Bridgewater uh, was a place that I explored, and to my surprise, was I was very intrigued by it. And I didn't, you know, I wasn't sure if it was going to work out. And ultimately, I spent a lot of time with Ray, 
uh, Dalio, who was, who was the founder, and, um, and he, we had the cell dinner, you know, the cell dinner where he was basically, uh, uh, we were going to make a decision whether I was going to come or not. And uh, Were you selling him or was he selling no, you? Well, this was it. He was sort of selling me that I should come do this. And his final con uh, concluding line in his sales pitch was, you know, I think there's a 50% chance you'll make it. And, uh, <laughs> and if you make it, this is going to be great. And uh, if you don't make it, you're going to be fine. You've got lots going for you. So um, that was the sales pitch. And I was thinking, well, you know, that's honest. It's probably the, that's probably the truth anywhere. But, um, but he was very forthright about it. And, uh, and so I came. And the culture, in some ways, was a shock because... The, you know, you know how most people, you say to your kids, your inside voice and your outside voice. Well, people have their inside voice, the thing they're thinking, and then there's the thing they're saying. Well, at Bridgewater, for the most part, we try to have every, that voice be the same. So if you're thinking it, you should say it. If you think it's a dumb idea, say it. If you think somebody's not very good at a particular thing, or they're not doing a good job on something, or something's not of sufficient quality, you say it. And that sounds very disruptive, but it actually is wonderfully liberating. Because when people start to operate that way, you don't have to worry about what they're actually thinking because they're telling you. And then you have an opportunity to actually deal with it right up front. Well, that's not very good. Why do you say it's not very good? Oh, well, he misses this. I see. That's a good point. Let's talk about it. Or that person's not right for the job. OK. That person probably knows that there's a conversation going on about them not being right for the job. To be able to have that conversation openly with everybody there, in some ways, reduces stress. It doesn't increase it. And so what I've learned is that that radical transparency, that candor, is really a necessary part, at least for us, of constantly improving. Um, the second uh, theme at Bridgewater is very much a sort of focusing on the mistakes um, and, the, and the weaknesses as a means for improvement. And that, that never struck me as an odd thing because I played sports my whole life. And how many coaches did you have that just walk down the, you know, the side of the field and tell you all the good things you're doing? No, they're telling you the things you need to improve on. And anybody that's really tried to compete in athletics at a, at a really high level knows that being excellent at that is a constant focus on the things that uh, you need to improve on. And so that's the second theme, is this constant focus on improvement by understanding what went wrong and trying to address that. And and understanding the strengths and weaknesses of a person so you can put them in jobs where they're going to be most successful. And um, the third theme related to the first two is this notion of an idea meritocracy, which uh, is the idea that this, and anybody that's been in business for a while already knows what I'm going to say intuitively, which here's a news flash: the senior people aren't always the smartest or they don't have the right ideas uh, often. That's often the case. And so when you have uh, when you have high, uh, a merit of decision making through hierarchy, um, you, you sometimes get people saying, no, this is what we're going to do, who really don't know what they're talking about. Where you have merit-based decisions, people get to actually put their opinions out there and say, well, OK, you're the decision maker, but here's the three reasons I think that's not a good idea. And then other people get to hear them say that. Oh, that's interesting. So-and-so said that's not a good idea. They have a point. And so you begin to debate ideas and decisions on the basis of merit not based on hierarchy. Now, it doesn't mean every opinion is the same. Different people have different believability or credibility with their opinions. So it's not like you listen to the mass crowd and crowdsource what you decide to do. But you draw in others into your decision-making process. And by doing that, you increase the probability of being successful. And I think this is how we run the business now. But this really emanated from Ray starting the business as a trader. And so if you think about, OK, you know, when we're really successful, we're right about 60% of the time, so which means we're wrong 40% of the time. So if we can increase the odds of being right by 5% or 10% by saying, here's the thought process, everybody bang around that thinking and try to test it to make sure it's, it's good. Oh, that person that's only been here three years who has a brain this big just found three things wrong with your thinking? Wow, that's a valuable thing. And so those concepts, ID meritocracy, um, radical transparency, constant focus on improvement through focusing on, on weakness and failure. In an environment that's truly caring, I know those things may seem in conflict to that, but truly caring about excellence of the firm, personal growth of each other, you know, deep caring, that's the, the magic formula that we're trying to, 
uh, keep going. That's what's made it successful. That's what we're trying to keep it successful. And for me, it's become a natural thing now. It was a little unnatural at first. It's become a natural thing. You mentioned um, how President Bush talked about you know, personnel decisions being the most important decisions even in a crisis. How are you working through the challenges of succession um, at, a, at, a, at a firm where the owner is uh, so associated with uh, the culture and, and the success? Well, it's been a rough road. Um, so I've been there 10 years. When I came, um, soon after I came, we started to talk about succession. And you know, there was some idea of multiple potential successors. So there was, it was not that, Dave, you're going to be the successor. There was, no, there was never going to be a single successor for Ray. But we laid out this idea that we were going to have a three pieces to our succession plan. One piece was an ownership transition where you know, we would, we would in, increase employee ownership and employee control, a transition from Ray being you know, the most significant owner to being a significant owner, but much more ownership spread across um, others who would then lead Bridgewater into the future. And that's been a process where we've had lots of internal people buy Ray's ownership over time, and we've had some help from outside investors. The second uh, piece of the transition was to codify the culture. So those principles I talked about, there's a lot more behind that. But, but basically, that way of operating, that doesn't happen naturally. In fact, it, it's a very unnatural way to be for most people. So how do you train people on that? How do you educate them? How do you make, that, how do you make them comfortable operating that way? What kind of tools and technologies can you put in place to help reinforce those key themes? So when I, was, when I first started, there really wasn't principles that you know today in the book. There was a, uh, I got a FedEx box. I was up in the Adirondacks with this printed copy of things with his crosses and the yellow lines and you know the dog-eared pages. And he then turned that into essentially a constitution, which we evolved together. It was his, his invention, but we evolved it a number of us evolved it together. And that now is a little bit of the basis for all the other things we're trying to do around culture. And that, that took some real time. And when you, lose, you know, when you lose a founder from being in the day-to-day -day management, um, and that founder, the culture really emanated from him or her, maintaining that's really a critical existential question. And that's, we spent a lot of time on that. The third piece was transitioning management. So we have an invest, we're an investment management firm. Ray is one of three CIOs. But he had been the chief executive for 40 plus years. Um, he had really done everything. So when I came in, he ran the client side of the business. He, you know, he'd be running from one thing to the next. He was you know, working 80 hours a week. And the question was, how do you extract him from that? And we've done that in fits and starts, lots of failures. So um, the first 18 months into, um, into that transition, he called me and said, hey, listen, I've been he had a protege, another colleague that um, had been sort of his key person for 20 years. He said, I'd like you to be the co-CEO, and I want to step out of this. And um, to make a long story short, 18 months later, he said, you're not doing a good job as co-CEO. I don't want you to be co-CEO anymore. So he fired me. And um, so that was at the three-year point, something like that. And I was thinking, OK, that's, that, that didn't work out well. And, uh, so I think I'm, uh, maybe I'm going to leave Bridgewater. Maybe I'm going to transition. But I was going through a, a bunch of personal stuff at the time. And I have young kids. And I didn't want to pick them up. And I said, well, I'll just put my head down for you know, the next year or two and try to get through some of the personal stuff, see how things go at Bridgewater. And I, or I became the president of Bridgewater. I was no longer the, the co-CEO. And I had a certain set of responsibilities. And, um, and that sort of was liberating, too, because I had never really failed at anything. That was a big, fat one. It was for everybody to see. You know, there was no escaping it. And uh, it created a good moment for me to think about what I really wanted to do. And so I stayed at Bridgewater for the next couple of years. And lo and behold, it started to be great. And I started to really love what I'm doing, what I was doing. And I started to be very, very successful at it. And um, to the point where Ray asked me to be the co-CEO a couple years ago, and I said, I, I don't know. It's, it's, not, you know. it's not all it's cracked up to be. And my current <laughs> job is pretty good, and I have a lot of control. And so let's talk about it. And we eventually agreed that I would come back and be the co-CEO. So I take you through that long story because lots of fits and starts. And anybody that uh, tells you that a transition from a founder 
iconic founder, whether it's Bill Gates or Warren Buffett or uh, Ray Dalio or Steve Jobs, whoever it is, it is hard work. And um, you have to be very systematic about it. And part of the design has to plan for things not working and learning from the things not working so you can evolve and grow and change. And so I'd say we're, we feel like we're in a pretty good spot. Still some things that are far from perfect, but it was only because we made a bunch of mistakes along the way that helped us clarify some things. Right. Well, as John alluded to, Bridgewater is a highly valued client here. It's one of the reasons we're so, we're so proud to have you. I want to talk a little bit about geopolitics before uh, we um, open it up for questions. You, know, you mentioned uh, in the Gulf, the uh, end of the Gulf War, the first Gulf War was very clear that the U.S. was sort of the defining superpower. You know, growing up of, you know, U.S., USSR, sort of defining bilateral relationship uh, and struggle. Um, who is on the other, we're no longer, I think people would agree the U.S. is no longer the sole superpower in, in the world. Who's on the other side of the bilateral relationship today? Well, I think the, the most defining bilateral relationship of our time, this group, is China, far and away. And, um, and, ha and how that, the rise of China and the reconciliation of China's role in the world with the role of the United States is handled um, will, I think, shape you know, uh, global economics and global geo geopolitics for, the, for, for decades to come. I think it's important to think about this not as the, you know, the trade dispute. This is so much more than the trade dispute. This is essentially an historical phenomenon that's happened throughout history before where you have a premier pre a preeminent power, um, economic power, political power, military power, and you have a rising power. And um, you know, China is, in many ways, the most remarkable economic story in human history. Um, as is the United States in, in, in a certain way. And, um, and how the United States deals with that, that rise of China and how China deals with it is, is gonna be imperative. And you know, a, a, a person many of you may know by name is Graham Allison who's written about the Thucydides trap and the fact that oftentimes when there's a rising power, more times than not, that doesn't go well. That ends in conflict. And um, given the size of the militaries and the economies and everything else, conflict is a devastating, you know, de that would be a devastating result. And so how one manages that is really, really critical. And um, there's lots of complexity involved in, in how to manage that. Um, on the US side, I think the complexity revolves around a bipartisan consensus um, that, uh, for the most part, that the relationship over the last decade or so hasn't gone well from a US perspective. Um, and by that I mean the aspirations and hopes of market access, of IP protection, of technology protections, um, have not gone as, as the Bush administration had hoped, as the Obama administration had hoped, as the Clinton administration had hoped, and as both parties in Congress had hoped. And so that creates a lot of constraints for policymakers because there's essentially a political view and a policy view that things need to change in terms of how that relationship's manifesting itself. On the Chinese side, you have um, also complexities where you have this um, a leader who has really laid out a vision for China that is um, uh, much more aspirational and explicit than it's been in, in past regimes. Um, you have enormous complexity around managing the Chinese economy um, through a significant growth but also significant indebtedness and the transition from the rural countryside to these urban areas and a transition from an export-led economy that's highly government controlled to more of an open economy that is more domestic, live, uh, driven by domestic demand. And so that's a highly political, highly complex undertaking with some extremely sophisticated policymakers on the Chinese side who have been at this for the last 20 years. And so um, both, of, and both of them are in a position where there's significant political stakes, poli significant political stake and risk of getting it wrong on the US side and the Chinese side. And so how they reconcile that in the near term and the longer term 
I think is the is going to be the the most significant challenge. And um, you know, you read the newspapers in and out, and uh, you know, my guess is we'll get through this next three months or six months or whatever that is. But that doesn't take away the ongoing challenge of managing that dynamic relationship. And I think that'll be the defining question for, for really for our country, or one of the defining questions. And from a national security perspective, as you look uh, the threats posed by Russia, North Korea, Iran, um, are they all created equal? Or is there one that um, should frighten people more than the other? Well, I think, the, um, I think we're in a, in a world where um, deep-seated paranoia is probably the appropriate posture. And by that, I mean, um, you know, with the evolution of artificial intelligence, cyber threats, um, all sorts of new capabilities, uh, there is a risk in any of those countries that you outline, a risk of them infiltrating um, the U.S. in some ways that we may know of or some ways we not even, may, may not even know of. And um, I described the greatest military in the world post-World War, or post uh, the Gulf War. Today, I think it would also be true that both in terms of spending and in terms of capability, nothing in the world would match our military. But the thing that should most concern us, I think, is the asymmetric threat. And so what's evolved is essentially the recognition that um, much of that military capability may be completely vulnerable to a cyber threat or some sort of um, asymmetric technology th threat that doesn't cost that much, um, that's the byproduct of some sort of technology breakthrough. And so I think we're in a world where we should be appropriately cautious um, and imagine the worst and be pleasantly surprised when things are much better. And, um, and we should also be recognizing the historical precedent, which is often our military capability has been much more focused on the war that we've last fought than the war of the future, and then we've had to play catch up. And so I'm not sure what the catch up will be against, but if you imagine that pattern may repeat itself, it should give you a, a, an appropriate sense of um, paranoia about what the possibilities are.